I invite you to turn in the Scriptures to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be in verses 25 through 34 this morning as we continue a very challenging series of messages on tackling four tough T's. Football teams whose defenses have a high percentage of missed tackles do not win championships. Christians who cannot, through the Word of God, and the indwelling Spirit of God tackle these four challenging tough T's are stymied, stunted in their spiritual growth and maturation. Last week, we tackled trials. Hopefully, we tackled trials, made progress in that area. Today, on Mother's Day, we're going to tackle tension or worry. A mother's heart is prone to worry and anxiety. Whether you have children at home or your children are grown, a mother's heart remains the same, and there is that tendency for a mother to be anxious and fretting and to worry about their children. But it's not just mothers. It's dads. It's granddads. It's people of all ages, senior adults and middle-agers and young adults, young married and singles and those who are still students in grade school and in college, people of all walks of life. We are all prone to give in to the tension that worry and anxiety brings. It's my prayer today that as we grow in the knowledge of God's Word that we will move to some degree, in our hearts and in our lives, we'll move from tension to trust in Jesus Christ. I want to begin reading in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount comprises the chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. The disciples had come to Jesus on the hillside. The onlookers came, and the crowds were there. Jesus was teaching, and and in chapter 6, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and in this, it gives a major portion of Scripture, 25 through 34, to tackling tension. I want to read just the first part of verse 25. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. The word therefore is a connecting word. It reaches back to the previous passage that actually starts in verse 19 where Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, and in verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. All throughout the Sermon on the Mount, it's about focus. It's about your heart. It's about putting God's kingdom in your heart, in your mind, and in your life ahead of the things in this world. Therefore, do not worry. It is a prohibition that comes from the Savior. The word worry is a compound word. It means to divide in mind. It's been said that worry is like a hyperactive dog in a fenced backyard racing around the perimeter of your skull until it runs a dirt path that nothing healthy can grow. And for some of you here this morning, that dog of tension is running all around your cranium and just wearing you out. Jesus says, do not worry about your life. The word life refers to the the, the total encompassing nature of your life and everything in it. He's going to talk about some things in this passage that just are illustrative of the comprehensive nature of our lives. He talks about the physical. He talks about the spiritual. Also implied, I think, our relationships, the totality of our life. Jesus says, do not worry. You know, worry is like putting your vehicle in neutral and revving the engine. It guzzles gas and wears the engine, but it gets you nowhere. That's worry. A guy by the name of Ross Broadfuhrer, you never heard of him. I hadn't heard of him either, but read this quote. He said, too many of us are worryaholics. That's true, isn't it? We're prone to worry. 
That's why we need this teaching of Jesus today. So we want to move to talking about reasons for not worrying. Jesus gets very analytical in this passage, and he gives us some very specific reasons not to worry. So I want to begin. Worry is unnecessary. Start over at verse 25 and read through verse 26, and then we'll move down to verse 28. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, I mean, really, when I read that right now, I'm thinking about lunch. I, I'm sorry, Lord, I've already, I've already broken it. But what will you eat or drink or about your body? What will you wear? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. Look at them. Isn't that amazing passage? They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Verse 28, why do you worry about clothes? I'm not going to go there. <laughs> See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Birds. They don't sow and they don't reap. Birds. They don't store away in barns, but the Heavenly Father provides for them. Now, birds do work hard. You've heard the trite but true statement that the early bird gets the worm. So Jesus is not saying here, you know, just sit around and wait for manna to fall from heaven. We have to work. And birds work. Birds are hard workers. I see them in our backyard. They're flying all around. I've got a bird's nest or two, and they're you know, going around. They're, they're getting stuff, you know, and we'll be having babies, and they'll be getting food for their babies and all kinds of things. They are hard workers. But ultimately, the Father provides for them. Look at the flowers of the field. Uh, this year, I had the privilege of driving back and forth from Alvin to Austin and seeing the blue bonnets every week. I've never seen them more beautiful. The amount of, of rain and, and the temperatures and, you know, whatever goes into that. I mean, they were huge and deep blue and plump. I've never seen blue bonnets so beautiful. And just think how God closed those blue bonnets. In ancient Palestine, the scarlet poppies would be across the hillside. Beautiful. And the Lord says, even Solomon, the wealthiest man in all the world, he had imported clothes and designer clothes and whatever he wanted, the latest and the greatest, Egyptian cotton, you name it, he had it. And the Lord says, not even Solomon. Not even Solomon was dressed as great as the way I dress the flowers of the field. Here today, gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire. Ladies, when the, in that ancient time, when scarlet poppies would begin to dry up, they would pick them. And they would store them, and they would dry out like flower petals do. And they would use them for kindling to go into the oven to start fires when they would be cooking. Here today, gone tomorrow. Jesus talks about two of the three of the secular trinity, and I think by implication there's a third, and that's food, fashion, and finances. And In this day and time, the Word of God still applies to us, and you have to have some of this green stuff to be able to get food and, and, and clothes. Jesus knows that. And Jesus is saying simply it is unnecessary to worry about it. I read a survey uh, this week and that like 40% of the things that we worry about never happen. 30% of the things we worry about happened in the past, and we can't change for all the worry in the world. 12% of the things we worry about are other people's opinion, uncontrollable. 10% of what we worry about is related to our health, which only makes our health worse. 
that leaves only 8% of the things that we actually worry about that we actually have to cross the bridge and face. 92% of the things that we get all worked up about, worry and the tension that it brings, never happen. Worry is unnecessary. Worry is unproductive. Look at verse 27. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? I can speak personally here. When I'm worried and tossing and turning at night, the hours get long. The time slows down and draws out. It also can be interpreted that you can't add to your height. I did some research on this, and if I remember correctly, a cubit is 18 inches. I'm thinking, man, if I had 18 inches to my height, I'd be in the NBA. I'd be over seven feet. Man, that'd be awesome, wouldn't it? But no amount of worry can make you one inch taller. In fact, worrying probably makes you shorter. It's just unproductive. It's like rocking in a rocking chair. It's something to do, but you don't go anywhere. (laughs) Worry is not only unnecessary, it is unproductive, but it's unspiritual. Look at the end of verse 30. You of little faith. Ouch. That really hurts, doesn't it? Jesus just gets to the heart of the whole thing as he's talking to his disciples and through the living word of God to you and me today. And he says the real issue is it's a spiritual issue because we're not trusting him. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. Easy to quote that scripture, hard to live. Preacher of yesteryear across the pond, George Mueller said, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Psalm 25, verse 1, in you, the psalmist said, in you, Lord, I put my trust, I trust in you. Ouch. When we are prone to worry, we're trying to take things in our own hands, things that are are simply and totally uncontrollable. And we're not trusting Him. Worry is also unworthy. Move down to verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or, what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. There are some things for the follower of Jesus Christ that are unworthy. Telling off-colored jokes, profanity, drunkenness. There are some things for the follower of Jesus Christ, there are some places that are just unworthy of our presence. I don't have time to detail those, so you're off the hook today. There are some things for the Christian that are just unworthy. And right in that list is worry. You know, the sad thing is that many surveys indicate that there's very little difference in the lifestyle of believers and unbelievers. And the testimony of many unbelievers is, well, hey, you know, your life is no different than mine. You go where I go. You do what I do. You say I have the same habits. I mean, really, there's no difference much in my life and your life except that you go to church on Sunday. What a travesty. The pagans, look look at this. He's talking about people who are not believers, and he says, 
They run after all these things. Run after, verse 32. Uh, That indicates an intense and passionate pursuit. Yes, there are things that we need in life, and we work, and, 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 and we provide for our families in, in, in that regard. And, and there are certainly things that we need, but Jesus is getting here at the heart of what drives you, the heart of our passion. What is it that you run after? What is it that you pursue? What is it that you're looking for to get satisfaction and joy and peace in this life? Are you running after possessions. I'm not saying it's wrong to have things, but the things have you. Are you running to things? Are you running to relationships? Are you running to experiences to gain satisfaction in life? If you're running to anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ, you are going to come up short. And so the question for you and for me this morning when it comes to our hearts, what are you running after? Or who are you running after? Worry is unworthy. These are the words of Jesus Christ, and He just tells us very plainly that worry is unnecessary, it's unproductive, it's unspiritual, and it's unworthy of a child of God. Well, in my Bible, verse 32 is at the bottom of the page. And so for me at least, I'm going to turn the page on worry. And we come to verse 33 and 34, and we want to talk about some re, uh, some, a remedy for tackling worry. And I would say to you up front that the remedies are spiritual remedies and not easy. I remember the story of a man who had one of these old metal tin trash cans. Of course, we now have stuff, you know, big big cans provided by the city. And the old tin trash can had served its purpose. The bottom of it was rusted, and there were some holes in it. And so finally he said, well, you know, I'm going to get rid of it. So he put that trash can out with the city trash cans, just knowing that the trash man would pick it up and throw it in the, in the truck and crush it up, and that'd be the end of it. But when he came home from work, the tin trash can was still there, all lined up with the, the two city cans. He thought, okay, they, they must not have got it. And so the next week, he turned the trash can upside down and said, they will see the holes, and they will see the rusted bottom, and they'll take it. He came home from work, and the trash can was right side up and in line with the city trash cans. He's thinking, what about this do they not get? So he took a hammer, and he beat on the trash can and had some dents in it and put a dent in the bottom of it, turned it upside down, and he says, now they'll know it's trash. He came home from work, and some of the dents had been straightened, and the trash can was right side up right by the other trash cans. He was furious. He went to the hardware store. He He bought a chain and a padlock, and he chained the tin beat-up trash can to a tree in his front yard. And yeah, you guessed it, the next morning, somebody had stolen the trash can. (laughs) Some things are hard to get rid of, and worry is one of those things that's just hard to get rid of. So how do we do it? Let me read verse 33 and 34. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What are all these things? All the things Jesus talked about, food and fashion, you know, the finances we need, stuff in this life. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. First, focus on the eternal, not the temporary. Jesus is very clear, seek first his kingdom. Go back to verse 32, run after your heart, 
your passion, your desire? What are you pursuing? What are you seeking? Even when it comes to food, even when it comes to clothes, when it comes to the the physical necessities of this life, we are to seek first what Jesus wants us to do and how he wants us to do it. Seek first the kingdom of God. All throughout the Sermon on the Mount, there is that thread that runs through that it, that it is about the spiritual, it is about the eternal, it is about the kingdom. What is your modus operandi in life? What is the driving force? We are to focus on the eternal, not the temporary. I, I just remember the story in Luke chapter 10 about Mary and Martha, unforgettable drama. Jesus and his disciples had come for a visit. They probably had a large home. They often went there. The Jesus and his disciples, kind of a retreat. And and Martha's in the kitchen. God bless her, getting the meal ready. And Mary is just sitting on her can in front of Jesus, having a great spiritual conversation. And Martha is, I mean, she looks out the window, stares at Mary. She's all stewed up. She's thinking and worried about, is the bread going to burn before the meat's ready? And it, when, is the water going to ever boil so the vegetables will be ready? And she looks out again and stares at Mary. And, and Mary's just having this conversation with Jesus. And, and, and Martha is just getting angry. I mean, she has angry eyes. And, and she's just stewing, and Jesus said in verse 41, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things. But only one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that which is better. It's not that the food didn't need to be prepared. I bet Mary and Jesus were having a spiritual conversation, and I imagine in my mind's eye that at some point that that Mary did get up and probably go into the kitchen and help out. But Jesus chided Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. What are you worried and upset about this morning? If you're a guest here this morning... You can check out. I'm not talking to you. Don't leave. (laughs) But you can mentally just check out because I'm just talking to West Oak Woods Baptist Church. I was thinking about the two-hour church conference we had the other Sunday night. Some of you were worried and upset about many things. This group is worried and upset because, my goodness, something was going to be changed. This group was worried and upset because this procedure or policy was going to be changed. And this group was worried and upset because the bylaws were going to be changed. Really, church? We need to focus on the eternal, not on the temporary. People are temporary. Policies are temporary. Procedures are temporary. Bylaws are temporary. Come on, let it go. Let's hold hands in unity. Focus on the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, the kingdom of God, reaching people for Christ, ministering to people in the name of Christ discipling people in the Word of God and in the name of Christ. All the other stuff is just stuff. Let it go. Focus on the eternal, not the temporary. And then live one day at a time, secondly. One day at a time. Okay, guess you can check back in now. Live one day at a time. I, I love what Jesus said. He was a realist. He said, each day has enough trouble of its own. He, he does it, it tell us that each day is going to have trouble. We do have trouble to different degrees. I got a text this morning while I was 
in the office. And one of my dear friends in Alvin's mom passed away today on Mother's Day. I just did a funeral Thursday in Hillsboro where I used to pastor years ago. And uh, Tina's asking me if I could do her mom's funeral. See, trouble just has a way of following us around. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about that family. So we have to live one day at a time. I'm reminded of the fable of the clock. And the clock got to thinking, man, I, there's 60 seconds in a tick. Every, I mean, there's six, 60 seconds in a minute. I, every minute I have to tick 60 times. And then it got worried and got to thinking, you know, that, that means that every hour I tick 3,600 times. And the clock began to get discouraged when it began to realize that in a day it ticks 86,400 times. And in a year, 31,560,000 times. And the clock got so burdened and discouraged that it began to lose time. It ticked slower and slower. And then finally one day it realized, but I only have to do it one tick at a time. And the clock put on its smiley face and began to pick up time and caught up time and said, I can do this one tick at a time. We can do this with God's help one day at a time. And then finally, trust the truth that your heavenly Father is in control. This whole passage, that's what he's talking about. I think twice he mentions the heavenly Father in this passage. And I would just say to you that your, our heavenly father is not like our earthly fathers. I had a, had a wonderful Christian dad, Baptist deacon, uh, great husband, but he was not perfect. No matter your father's situation, our, your heavenly father is not like your earthly father. Your heavenly father is ever-present. He'll never abandon you. Your heavenly father provides for you always present and eternally. Your heavenly Father has plans for you. You can trust Him. He provides for the birds. He provides for the flowers. He provides for nature. And you are the crown of His creation, created in His image, and He will care for you. Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord himself, the Lord, is the rock eternal. I thought about this morning. I looked it up, the old hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow. Right, some of the young ones won't know, but some of you folks know. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled, his tender word I hear. And resting on his goodness, I lose my doubts and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when songs give place to sighing, when hope within me dies, I draw the closer to him. From care he sets me free. His eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, I know he watches me. And the refrain... I sing because I'm happy, 
I sing because I'm free. For his eye, church, is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. My challenge to you this morning is to move from tension to trust. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us. We're so prone to worry and anxiety and the the tension that that brings, the knots in our stomachs, the headaches, the sleepless nights. Lord, every one of us here, no one is exempt from that temptation. Thank you for your word. And help us, help us, Jesus. We need your help. Help us to move from tension to trust you more fully. Lord, if there's someone here today that needs to trust you as Savior and Lord and say, I want to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and know that I'm heaven-bound, sewed up for all eternity, then I pray today would be the day of salvation. I pray that whatever is hyperactive dogs running around the perimeter of the skull of individuals here today. They would take that tension and move it, move it visually, move it spiritually, move it prayerfully by casting their care upon you and trusting you. We ask these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Let's move from tension to trust together.